Do you like boys? Do you like girls? Uh -oh. Do you like boys? Do you like girls? Come to Yoruba. Good year. Featuring in house DJ. DJ in house. Flyers under the door. Online invites. Yoruba. Vodka energy. Whiskey cola. Come on, forget this. Yoruba! Yoruba! Come Yoruba. to Yoruba! Enlightened masses, I'm Oren Lefkowitz. And I'm Ford Donovan. This is the McTavish Radish, and here are today's top stories. It was a Dabouleon disaster this past weekend as a McGill Theater cast and crew was shocked to discover that all of them had brought pita and hummus as their contribution to their potluck bonding session. Despite the glaringly obvious lack of leadership that led to the mix-up, all attendees remained calm and resilient as they pretended that nothing was wrong and that the quote, garlic hummus really complements the roasted pine nut hummus. An ordinary intro to European history lecture took an unexpected turn this week when the professor and his students seized the opportunity to draw hundreds of penises on a sleeping student's body. Reports indicate that the sleep-deprived first year, Andrew Altman, dozed off approximately 20 minutes into the lecture whereupon the professor quieted the class, grabbed a black sharpie from his desk, and proceeded to draw a life-size phallus on Altman's cheek. After the student had been sufficiently vandalized, the professor resumed his lecture on the Punic Wars. It's day two of the Chef on Call corruption trial, and from what we can tell, the tension was so palpable you could taste it. <laughs> <laughs> Legal correspondent Jane Locked and Loaded Davies is at the Palais de Justice at the scene of the trial. Jane, what can you tell us about the day's events? Oren, it's been a long day down at the courthouse, with countless witnesses brought to the stand and both sides cross-examining like the Roman soldiers of Golgotha. Chef on call, who has been accused of bribing McGill professors into creating harder exams, seemed to be holding up all right for the most part. But that all changed in a flash when the founder of Chef on Call, Roberto Malbagot's iPhone, was anonymously submitted and presented to the court. Discovered in the chef's phone were records of countless phone calls, text messages, and even a few unopened Snapchats between Mr. Malbagot and several McGill professors. In exchange for harder exams which covered more and more course material, the chef gave these professors everything, from briefcases of straight cash all the way to two-for-one chicken burgers. The court was astounded, and I gotta tell you, Oren, that's when things really got ugly. From playing the naive and innocent card, the chef quickly devolved into a finger-pointing tyrant set on bringing everyone down into the deep fryer with him. He made allegations against everybody. Almost all the late-night ghetto restaurants were targeted as the chef played the, but everyone else was doing it too, card. He called Basha a fraud and told Mr. Alto to go fuck himself. To everyone in the courtroom, the man seemed utterly pathetic. Or did he? Was the chef just spewing grease stains of nonsense? Or was the chef on call? on the ball. To provide further insight into these alleged conspiracies, we now turn to Max Katz. Now Max, what can you tell us about these heavy- Jane, what Mr. Malagot is referring to here is a deep-seated history of corruption dating back to 1958, when the Big Seven restaurants began regularly meeting with McGill administrators. Around this time, several McGill departments began adopting secondary examinations falling halfway through the semester, referring to them as middle semester examinations, or as we know them today, midterms, a concept completely alien to students before this consolidation. After that, Jane, it spiraled out of control with courses administering multiple midterms a semester with increasing levels of difficulty to the point where most of the school year can be referred to as a, quote, midterm season. But Max, I don't understand. 
what do the late night ghetto restaurants have to do with creating hard midterm exams? I don't see it. Jane, Jane, Jane Doe, dear. These restaurants invented midterms. What Max told me that day was disturbing to say the least. Part of me just wanted to huff some paint and forget about it. But I knew the truth was out there, somewhere, and I was determined to find it. After a few wrong turns and some close calls, I found Mrs. Desiree Baraka, McGill Education, class of 59. Oh, Alto, I remember it well. Used to love my part-time job working there. That was back in the days before all the lobbying and corruption. When did these changes begin? I think it was back in around 1957. Yeah, 1957. A new chancellor had been named. I think it was Richard Powell. Yes, Richard Powell. And he used to come into the shop. He used to love souffle. And our boss at the time, he was trying to make ends meet because things were very, very hard. And he noticed that the students basically only came in around exam time. So he came up with this idea and he jokingly said to the chancellor, why don't you give the students more exams? And if you do, you can have souvlaki for life. And he laughed. Didn't think anything of it. But then a couple of days later, the boss comes to us and says, you're never to charge the chancellor any money for this food. He's not to be charged. Did you notice a change in the university and the workload? It used to be one wild party after another wild party until exam time, finals, and then we would cram and study. And my grandson, Ilan, I told him, you're working too hard. Let up a little bit. Frosh week, frosh semester, all semester. From what we can tell from inside the courthouse today, the shuffle will be going away for a long time. So if you want to make that order of buffalo chicken, you'll have to make that call to prison. Thank you, Jane. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Big story.